Hello, I'm your guest host, Charlie Chapman, a developer advocate at RevenueCat. And with me today is RevenueCat CEO, Jacob Eiding. Our guest today is David Barnard. You know him as the host of this very fine podcast, but he's also a longtime indie developer with his company, Contrast, and a growth advocate, and my coworker, at RevenueCat. On the podcast, we talk with David about the many failures of his recent app launch, the surprising results of his first ever A-B test, and the many reasons why you shouldn't plan a big app launch. All right. Hello, David. Welcome to your show. Long time host, first time caller. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So I'm Charlie. This is David, the long time host of this podcast, first time guest. And with us as well is Jacob Eiding, my boss and CEO of Revenue Cat. Yeah. I like the way you did it in the pre-show, which was, and Jacob's here too. <laughs> yeah. Good yeah. way to sum up my presence. Too. <laughs> yeah. The reason I am in the host seat and David's in the guest seat is because David just released a really big update to one of his apps. And he has some learnings, to use a corporate phrase here, I guess, to kind of share some things that he learned as part of this launch process. And we thought it would be interesting to sort of walk through that. And so I'm here to try and fill David's shoes to walk us through that update. So and I think we're liberated here, Charlie, to be a little more direct than we typically are with a guest that we've invited and, you know, on good terms with to bring on here. But in this case, David's kind of a, if he wants his show back, I think he's going to have to <laughs> Oh, am I taking, candid. is this a hostile takeover? <laughs> well, I don't know. You are sitting in the host chair. So I think, right. I think you have squatters rights. <laughs> I'm an open book looking forward to sharing whatever you want to ask dangerous way to start this out. Before we get into WeatherUp 3.0, which is the update that we want to talk about, I want to give everybody a primer of your background as app developer, not as growth advocate of RevenueCat. So what is your story as an iOS app developer leading up to this WeatherUp 3.0 launch? I was a struggling independent recording engineer in 2008 and not seeing my wife because I was working like 2 p.m. to 2 a.m. and she was working nine to five. And when rumors of the iPhone SDK started circulating, which I saw because I was an Uber Mac nerd working in a recording studio, I started thinking, hey, this could be a really good opportunity. So within days of Steve Jobs announcing the iPhone SDK, it wasn't even called iOS back then, I started a company and I initially intended to code all the apps and started learning how to code and got like three weeks into that and thought to ship something in the summer, I should probably find a professional. So I hired a contractor and started building apps. And I've launched 20 something apps on the app store, seen close to 10 million downloads and millions of dollars in revenue. So I've been at it a long, long time, 16 years now. Starting from the beginning, you've gone through many different business model iterations of the App Store, and I assume your apps have as well. Yeah. It's funny to me talking to developers these days who don't know the full history of the App Store and the fact that in-app purchase didn't even exist. So early on, we did all sorts of crazy stuff. Like a popular pattern for a long time was a free quote unquote light version of the app, kind of what freemium exists today. And it's almost like your free trial. And then you push people to the paid version of the app. Which was always HD, right? Or was that when the yeah. iPad came along? <laughs> that was iPad. That was iPad. Yeah. All right. yeah, I guess a little context for me too, just so you understand my weird references. I came into the iOS game a little later. I became an iOS developer and started building stuff in 2019. And I was actually Android until like 20. 16. So I learned most of my history through podcasts like this before I was an employee here. So yeah, most of that is like me getting that secondhand as well. Yeah. Then I did the whole like free version with a ton of in-app purchases to like try and increase the average revenue per user. The craziest experiment there, I launched a timer app and it was like 99 cents and it was doing fine. And then I relaunched it as a free app with a ton of in-app purchases. Like, oh, you want this theme? It's 99 cents. You want that theme? And in the app was a quote unquote ultimate bundle, which I think was 10 bucks, which at the time it seemed totally ridiculous. 10 bucks for a timer yeah. app. But people bought the freaking ultimate bundle because they just wanted everything. And so I was making well, 10 was a better deal, on David. This, You'd be stupid not to take app. the better deal, <laughs> you know? It was great. And that was 2010, 2011 or something, just experimenting with business models. And then I started switching my apps to subscription in 2017 after Apple opened things up. And then, I mean, that's how I ended up at Revenue Cat and Subclub Podcast and everything else was trying to switch my apps to subscription and it being such a huge pain in the ass where we were spending <laughs> way more time on the subscription app 
code and infrastructure than we were building a product. So yeah. So when did the first weather app version, like of those 20 apps, you remember like when you first were like, I'm going to do a weather app, was it your first weather app? Technically my third weather app. So perfect weather was the first weather app I did, but it was like 2010, 2011. So I've been building weather apps for over a decade now, and then launched a whole brand new SKU new app as Weather Atlas in 2017 ish. And then Weather Atlas got rebranded as Weather Up. Was Weather Atlas basically a rebrand then? You said it was a new SKU. No, though? no, no. It was a new SKU, everything. It was just, we wanted to switch to subscription. It was just such a brand new take. It's like file new project. Take everything I learned from Perfect Weather. It was a new partner. That's another thing. Since I don't code, I've had this weird mix of working with contractors that I pay and then some combination of pay and do a rev share. I started doing the partnership thing back in 2010, 2011 after two projects went sideways. So each of those projects, I lost 50 grand. So I, I was working with developers. They made all the promises in the world, but I was paying them hourly and the projects just drug on and on and on. And I realized like these aren't going to ship, stop throwing good money after bad. And I just wrote off a hundred thousand dollars that I'd paid out. That's when I started thinking, okay, I need to work with somebody who's got a little more skin in the game. Yeah. 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 Developers without downside risk. There's nothing worse in the world. <laughs> <No>. Yeah. <laughs> But then that has its own challenges. When somebody's working on it as a side project, they can get busy with their jobs. And so it's been a struggle too, working with that model. So I don't want to spend too much time on the history, but I think one other thing that is probably related to the 3.0 launch for WeatherUp is what was your marketing strategy for all of these apps then? You presumably didn't have a huge advertising budget or something, at least initially. How has that sort of evolved over time with all your apps? Yeah, it depends on the app. I've relied very heavily on organic channels. I've done very little paid advertising. Early in the app store, I actually did spend thousands of dollars trying to make it work. And like with paid apps, it just was total money losing proposition. But mostly I've relied on getting attention, Apple's attention, press attention. And then ASO has been really big for my apps generally, like Launch Center Pro was the top result for a bunch of like launcher and other kind of terms. So it got a lot of browse traffic. That's actually one of the things that we'll get to with a weather app, trying to get any kind of organic traffic. Those keywords are just so crowded, which makes it really hard. But one of my most successful apps was a mirror app. And go figure, at its peak, something like 10 or 20,000 people searched the app store for a mirror every day. And I was capturing six, 8,000 of those every single day. As an ignorant crazy. person, what does a mirror app provide that like <laughs> the camera does not? So it's genuinely a good app. And I made an embarrassing well, amount of I didn't of money imply it app. wasn't, David. You did. <laughs> One of the main things is that the front facing camera, if you just launch the camera app, it's in a little window with all the Chrome around it. So this launches to like a full screen mirror. You can zoom in. We did some really cool stuff. Like you tap a little flashlight button and it puts white around the edges of the screen and turns the brightness up to a hundred percent. So that in dark or low light situations, it's actually really helpful. Like one of those lighted mirrors and stuff. And then we had a really cool way where you tap the screen to like freeze the frame and then you can save that as a photo. So it's a kind of cool way to preview your selfie before you save it. Little things like that. But people love that app. I guess it becomes the thing you know to search for, right? It's interesting the different sort of niches will inform your strategy, like how you can acquire users. I think it's almost the opposite. I think it's like somebody's like, I need to check to see if my lipstick looks right. And they don't even think I can open the camera app. They're just like, is there like oh, a, mirror a mirror thing? Oh, and then, you know, you just search yeah. for it. Yeah, You're trying yeah. to solve a problem and you go to the app store. If the app store is your default search engine, uh, it can drive a surprising Apple amount of yeah. creating that loop. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> convincing people with normal human people problems to look for software. Let's just think about how magical that is for a moment. Yeah. I'm always surprised when I look at my app figures, ASO tab and see that I'm ranking well and getting downloads from full sentences. Like I want a <laughs> green noise. I make a white noise app, a green noise for free or something like that. And it's like, people are just typing full blown search queries. But yeah, I asked that because in the earlier era, getting attention, if that's kind of your big marketing strategy, I don't necessarily want to say it's easier, but it's definitely different because like in Apple features days? in the early oh, no, it's days. Way yeah. easier. How many okay. apps are there now, David? <laughs> Yeah. Like no, no, no. millions there's, of there's apps millions now. and millions. There were like no. when I launched my first app, there were 270 apps on the app store. 
you didn't need attention. There were 270 apps on the app store. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I guess there's the, always ever people talk about literally scrolling the list of apps. Yeah. You could look at every single app, week. right? And by 2011 or 12, I mean, it was different, but it still, we were talking probably an order of magnitude fewer apps than there are today. And it's still to some degree, like getting attention, especially in the early teens, you know, 2010, 2011, 12, 13 was like the most predictable thing you could do, right? And to some degree it is. And I think it's probably one of the better, more predictable ways to like try to break through the noise if you know how to do it. But yeah, we should talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you have no marketing budget. So yeah, let's talk about WeatherUp then. And like you mentioned earlier, WeatherUp was a rebrand of Weather Atlas, you said, and there's been multiple versions of it over time. So when it came time to this WeatherUp 3.0 launch, what was the state of WeatherUp at that time? Well, I mean, Weather Up 3.0 has been a, a long time in the making. As I mentioned, you know, working with App Partner, my cousin, he was busy with other stuff and had a lot going on. And so this has been a very long, slow, started in 2019, actually, like the designs for the widget. That's when Charlie started doing apps. Yeah, actually, it's yeah. Called. Yeah. <laughs> so when yeah. I first opened Xcode, for real. <laughs> What kind of kept happening was we would get deep enough into one specific feature and then just kind of realize, oh, well, to get attention, we really should be doing X and we finished Y. And I mean, at this point, I actually regret not just shipping. So like we were pretty far First along with the learned. Apple oh, Watch app. Yeah, just ship. Like we should have shipped the Apple Watch app in 2020, probably when that was ready. But that was when widgets got really big and sort of like, now we got to build a widget. So at WWC 2020, we're like, well, okay, we got to build a widget. We can't just launch the Apple Watch app. Then we we're so close to launching the widget and then Apple announced interactive widgets. And it's like, well, we can't just launch a widget when everybody else is launching interactive widgets. And so we should have just launched, but we held off. The tough thing about getting attention is that you do have to do something unique. Well, widgets were really cool and unique in 2020 when they first were home screen widgets, but 2021, that's not enough to get attention. Apple Watch apps, complications, like all these things. And that's the trade-off. The calculus for me was, well, let's wait and try and make a big splash with all these things. But really, like at this point, we could have already had launched the widget and just adding interaction at the level we did would have gotten attention. You'd be on weather up 7.0. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> So presumably then that long of an amount of time without major new features was impacting the business then? Or were downloads oh, yeah. pretty much just swimming along? Yeah. I mean, that's one of the big regrets. I was actually just looking at app figures recently and downloads were pretty consistently good. And we had some nice spikes from getting attention or being part of big launches with new iOS features and stuff like that all the way up until about 2019 when things went on hiatus and we were working towards this bigger update and things really dropped off the map. Like Apple stopped featuring the app because it hadn't been updated in a while. We stopped getting any kind of bumps from these new updates and things like that. So coming into the weather app 3.0, I mean, it's almost like launching a whole new app because downloads were at low double digits a day, like 15 downloads a day. I mean, I guess for some indie apps, that's a lot. But it's hard to build a business and make any money on that. So the revenue was down. I've actually been losing money on the app for like 18 months. I've been funding it out of my own investing income. In the future, David. Investing in the future, yes. And again, I think that was one of the mistakes. And that's the beauty of subscription apps too, is that except for the getting attention, there's no incentive to hold back features like launching a big 3.0 where you're doing a paid update where everybody's paying you for the features. Well, nobody was going to pay me any more because I launched those features. So I should have just launched them and kept moving. Yeah, because even a really massive, big, splashy launch amortized over the time between big launches, that time in between big launches is arguably a lot more important than how splashy the launch itself is. Unless you're just starting out, that's where it can make a really big difference to start from a big stepping stone. I think the big launch philosophy has been one of like the great mistakes of my career. There's so many incentives to be like, oh yeah, we're just going to roll this together into a big thing. Or like, we're going to put this all together in the fall. You're honestly justifying not shipping, right? You're being like, I'm not lazy or I'm not scared. This is strategy, right? And it's yeah, like, for no, me, it's definitely it's fear, not. right? Is like, yeah, oh, exactly. yeah, <laughs> uh, I don't want to like, I'm not going to show this to the world because I need this one little extra thing. Otherwise people are going to ignore me. I do think it's a legacy of box software, really, though, the mindset. And it did work prior to subscriptions. 
when especially paid up front apps, it works really well. Like launching a pro would get massive spikes in revenue where it'd make like 60 K in a week. Then we'd go along making, you know, hundreds of dollars a day, hundreds of dollars a day. And then we'd have another big launch and they would go up. But I mean, why is it even called weather up 3.0? Like, what's the 3.0? And- it's like, yeah. And prior to that mindset, so I think a bit too, it was like all about building and packaging these big updates. And then we're talking about leveraging that into love from Apple and the press, right? So there were like a bunch of these compounding things. But I think you're right that if you re amortize that over the time of value delivered, right? Those features that you withheld for four months are not compounding or four years or whatever are not compounding over that period. And I think it's really easy for that to overcome. And then, of course, there's always, I think, just the psychosocial aspect of it is that if you're not shipping, you're not shipping. And if you're not shipping every day, you're not shipping, your probability of never shipping goes up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. I think we're, especially in the sort of Apple sphere. I think a lot of us have a tendency to think of our marketing like Apple's marketing. And it's like, yeah, Tim Cook can sneeze and that can be like a news story. We are not that. And so do you have a Phil Schiller? You should get one. <laughs> yeah. Then you could be Apple. Yeah. But you okay. don't have a Phil Schiller, right? Like Apple's marketing is world class and they're professional, right? And it's and not it's just built the brand on decades and, how it and looks. decades and decades of. Yeah. Legacy. They know the cadences. They know how to control the narrative. They know how, you know what I mean? And, and they are doing paid updates, though. That's the thing is like a lot of their launches are convincing you to get a new iPhone. And so it is like save it up, save it up, save it up, and then do a big Yeah, they launch. have hardware to deal with. Yeah. Right? And when it was box software, that was part of the deal. You had to hold back those features and early in the app store you would release a new SKU as a paid update because there was no way to monetize that user base over time i think a lot of what y'all were just saying i keep thinking yes because subscription business model allows you to accrue that value over time and make it compound versus the old model of paid apps and paid updates didn't allow you to do that. Point taken, like nobody cares about those things anymore. And so don't hold off on shipping. And that was a mistake I made was for the last four years, kind of getting trapped in that old mindset that did work in the past for me, but no longer works in the same way because that's not how I run my business. I think each small update is an opportunity to reach for attention and maybe not like send an email to your press contact or whatever, because that you can oversaturate. But if you're constantly making small updates and each time you can make a little video or something of that update, every single one of those is a chance to catch somebody new's attention. And oftentimes what they're going to see is an old feature that just happens to be part of your demo. You're like cashing in on an old feature or something each one of those times. Like most people aren't getting tired of you tweeting too often because most people don't see it in the first place. And then, like you said earlier, one of you two, is if you're constantly tweeting to the point of almost being annoying, it also kind of signals, I get this with Revenue Cat stuff. You guys are pushing so much stuff out, I can barely keep up, which kind of shows that like I'm on top of things. We're constantly coming out with new stuff. Even if you don't use it, that signal adds value, perceived value anyway, to your product. And for a weather app like this, I mean, I'm sure a lot of it's the mass market, but for getting a start, for getting anything written about it or whatever, you have to at least like appeal to the connoisseur of apps, right? And somebody's going to check how many updates there were and like da, 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 da. So yeah, let's get to the actual launch itself then. So what was your, I guess, strategy going into that launch? We already talked about the actual update. It was interactive widgets and a watch app, right? But what was your plan for getting attention? press and, you know, hoping to get featured by Apple. We'll get into mistakes, but I kind of did the same playbook I had for years was I know if I do something innovative, I can get some attention for that innovation. And then typically when you do something really innovative with a feature like interactive widgets that Apple has been really pushing heavily and was a big new kind of part of the OS update, you can get attention. So my goal for the launch was to get as much attention as I could from press, from Apple, from others make some money and then take that and start experimenting with Apple search ads. And then if that went well, start expanding marketing beyond that. But that's not how things went, which we'll get to. Yeah. How are you trying to get that attention? I know you, most people listening know you, you have a lot of contacts. What was your general strategy to try and get those press articles and Apple features? 
people say, oh, well, you know people and that's how you get featured. But I don't think that's totally true. It helps. They will at least scan my email or at least see that I DM them. And maybe I have like a tiny bit of baked in credibility because they know me or have known me for a while or whatever. But at the end of the day, and I think about this all the time, is that I'm not actually going to capture their attention unless I do something that they care about. And so for me, thinking about reaching out to all my press contacts, I would be embarrassed to send them whether up 3.0.1 update with like one tiny little feature that's not even interesting. I still feel a ton of pressure to do something that's actually interesting in the market that they're going to be willing to write about. Because I'm not going to push somebody to write about something that's not actually interesting. And that's where... For this particular update, I worked on a video that demonstrated the features. Funny enough, Jake Moore, who we've had on the podcast a ton and done a ton of stuff with, the CEO of Superwall, has been talking about for years how impactful videos are for paywalls. And with this interactive widget, it felt like it just something so visual that it needed a video. So I was working on the video for the paywall primarily. And it turned out so good that ended up being my press pitch. So instead of hundreds of words, I mean, you just have so little time to capture somebody's attention. So the main way I pitched it was like a DM on Twitter and like, Hey, I'm working on some really cool interactivity for widgets and weather. I think this is really interesting. And I got quite a few people who are like, yeah, I don't really cover apps anymore. Or, you know, I wouldn't How'd typically you get this cover an app. <laughs> <laughs> but they saw the video and were like, wow, that looks really cool. So I think whether or not you have a relationship with somebody, because a lot of the people I pitched, I didn't know and they didn't know me, but it's all about communicating that value and it being something that's actually worth them writing about. And that video like really helped. Yeah, because it's not just value to the user. It's also interest for a story, which are slightly different. I mean, you got to help them get their story written for the week, right? Like they have a job, they have a quota, they have a number of things you have to produce. And if you want them, help them do their job and find something mutually beneficial for all three parties, right? The reader, the journalist, and you, if I was to say any sort of distillation of how to do PR, it's that like build something that's mutual, like to win to all parties. And it's hard. You have to find something they're interested in, right? You read about what they do. You learn about, you know, whatever. Well, I mean, this is February of 2024, which like every tech and otherwise online outlet in journalism is disappearing right now, like on the daily. So maybe you're like the last one to get this in before writing about apps just doesn't exist anymore. If you needed any more signs that this model of launching is no longer, <laughs> like, that might be it. To that same point, it's not just, is it interesting? but is it interesting currently? You had a little bit of an uphill battle. Well, you had a huge uphill battle, which we'll get into in a second, but even ignoring what happened on your launch day, you weren't launching this when iOS 17 was coming out with these interactive widgets, where huge regret. people <laughs> in the press were literally begging, please send me your interactive yeah, widgets. Yeah, I need some. I need yeah, something they to it. ship about, and I don't want to just copy Apple's press release. Right? right, you had to pitch them on it. In was this January when you were starting to kind of reach out? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. like not only did you need it to be compelling in its own right as a story that they already want to write, but you had to make them want to write it well after the readers are demanding this anyway. Let's move to the actual launch because this is where things get pretty interesting. So I guess I'll just let you take it away. But how was your launch day itself? Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Really, really bad. Well, at least you uh, didn't. After, at least you didn't wait four years for it. So that's good. Yeah, I know. After <laughs> four years of hard work, of all the things to happen, I had scheduled the launch, put it on my press page. So if you go to press.contrast.co, we'll link it in the show notes. But I create a press page for every release that I'm trying to get a little press for. And on there, I put the launch date and time. So it's kind of the embargo time. So I did talk to a few journalists and I had set this time. And it turned out that at the exact same moment, Apple was planning on announcing their DMA compliance. And so somebody from the press reached out and said, hey, there's big news coming an hour from now. Can I just publish now? And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, that's not coming. a good sign. Like, it's like, all right, just go for it. Then I reached out to other folks that I thought might be writing about it and told them, like, go ahead and, and write about it. And then even like 9to5Mac was like, hey, I think we should just wait till tomorrow. They didn't even publish till the next day. And then several of the people I was talking to got so distracted with the DMA news that they didn't even write about it. So there was like layers there of one, 
It didn't get written about by as many outlets as would have likely written about it had it not. Then two, there wasn't any kind of like social halo because the air got sucked out of the room. So people who may have seen it and may have otherwise tweeted about it or said, hey, this is cool, or other journalists see TechCrunch write about it and they write their own story. Instead, everybody was like super busy. I didn't with the even DMA. know you launched that day, David, to be honest. Like I was so busy. <laughs> like I think on a normal day. I, I was going to say even that. including you, David, like people on that day, you are one of the people that people go to Twitter or whatever yeah. to find. So it's like they go to your Twitter and they might see like, hey, I launched this new thing. And they're just scrolling to find your take on exactly. this new thing. Because yep. this is why I don't discourage side apps explicitly because the world just discourages side hustles. All the time. <laughs> right? Like your, your main gig will always destroy <laughs> anything you try to do. <laughs> yeah. So like an hour into my app launch and I didn't know what the news would be, but an hour into the launch before I even had a chance to like tweet it from the company account before even some of my own launch day plans plans were finished. Apple announced that. And then I was like all hands on deck with you and Jacob and everybody else at Revenue Cat trying to figure it out. And then scheduling a webinar for the very next day and like reading through all the documents and chatting about it internally. And so what would have maybe otherwise been a lighter Revenue Cat day where I take a little personal time to celebrate my app launch was just complete decimated. So instead, I was up till like 2 a.m. reading the fine print of European regulation to host a webinar the very next day. It was just about as big of a disaster as you could possibly have when your plan is to get attention. Apple still hasn't featured and I'm not totally sure why, but I have a feeling it's that, well, two things, and this is a regret that I have now looking back is I was trying to squeeze it in ahead of Vision Pro. And I thought so much air was going to get sucked out of the room from Vision Pro. What I didn't know was Apple was distracted with the DMA, but the whole editorial team was, I'm sure, so busy with the launch of the Vision Pro. I never could have known that the DMA would be such a big deal and would be launched on that day. But I should have known that the App Store editorial team would be super busy with the Vision Pro. And the reason I was trying to get it out was to launch, was to like actually ship versus like, oh, now we need to build a Vision Pro app before we can ship. And so I was trying to get out before the Vision Pro so that people weren't asking, well, where's your Vision Pro app or whatever. Well, it turns out a month later, I don't think anybody would ask for a Vision Pro app anyway. <laughs> so hindsight 2020, I should have just waited a month and let the Vision Pro stuff blow over before launching. But that's a top tip. Sub Club listeners, if you're going to launch your app, don't do it on the day that Apple announces the DMA. <laughs> so take that one, write that one down <laughs> yeah, in your notebook. This is really actionable. This applies Advice, to all yeah. businesses You'll do better yeah. if you pick a different day than the day that the App Store melts down in Europe. But it's another side effect of the big launch. If you put all your eggs into one big launch basket, you're sometimes you're just going to catch a stray. Some big news article is going to come out. It happens with fundraisings too. Like companies put big like efforts behind their fundraising announcement. And then that morning, whatever company files for bankruptcy and the entire like startup news scape is like covered with that, right? Nobody cares. Or some other company raises more or whatever. That's just a risk. And there's sometimes a little bit you can do to like de-risk that. Maybe you have a friendly contact in the press that tells you, hey, there's already an embargo news drop that day. But like, you're not usually that lucky. But if you're launching more often, and you have a little more even, you know, you're de-risking your launch plans by having many small launches. And you can always try to do both, right? Why can't you just have many small launches and big launch too, right? I think yeah. you can kind no, of No, and that, that's what I should have done. I could have done that. We could have launched the Apple Watch app and it would have just been launch a it quietly, launch. Blah, 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 and then be like, this is Weather Up 3.0. They've never seen it. These journalists have never seen it. Like you can that's lie. What I, was gonna I don't say. know. You're saying the big launch and I think big launch maybe has two meanings. There's like the big launch in the sense of you're holding a bunch of stuff for this one big launch. But there's also the meaning of like making your launch big, like going for just being loud and everything. And you can be loud once a month. I mean, this is the YC advice. If you have a launch that goes poorly, just launch again. The definition of a bad launch is nobody sees it. So nobody's going to see you do it again. Right. Did <laughs> Revenue Cat like, do that? I think oh, yeah, you said yeah, that yeah, on, I mean, like, on stage <laughs> somewhere. So I like, think yeah, we okay. posted on Reddit and it kind of got some steam. And then we launched a beta. Like every time we fundraise, we're like, Revenue Cat's launching out of blah, blah, blah. We make some stuff up. And it's a little bit of a wink and a nod. Like we're always doing stuff, right? Yeah, I guess it's a little bit of showmanship just to like put a narrative to the building you've been doing. And you can kind of do, but I mean, look at Tesla. Like every big company juices up 
stuff they've been working. You know, they dress it up, they push it. That's what marketing. I, I mean, mean, every Apple keynote but... starts with a bunch of things that sound like launches that only all the super nerds are like, we've heard this before, right? But most people watching it are like, this is new. <laughs> like, this is okay. The yeah, here's a new right, laptop. Who are watching, which is probably who it's for. But yeah, I mean, it's the power of narrative control, right? Like, you can really kind of drive the narrative. And I always tell you guys before the start of podcast, this is all made up. Everybody right? all of it's made up. You can just contrast is made up, but yeah, nothing you can do to control for like just dumb luck. And it feels like in this particular case, kind of the mistake, if you were to say that would be you made a lot ride on this single event and then things that are outside of your control can go wrong. And you gave up on all of the smaller events that could have happened over the last three years or whatever, and put it all into kind of all your quivers behind or I don't know the phrase, something with a bow and arrow and putting everything behind the one bow <laughs> or arrow. All my eggs in one basket. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And so that maybe is like the mistake that happened here. But I guess maybe the more interesting thing then is what now? What are you going to do? Are you going to do like Jacob said, are you going to try and relaunch? Short answer, yes. I want to actually go through more of the failures oh, of yeah, the yeah. launch. And to give the audience a little bit of context, Jacob and I were chatting Friday and I was like, we were talking about the podcast broadly and we've had some really great guests on, but one of the things I want to do more is talk to people who have failed and talk about even the ones who have succeeded about all the failures leading up to the success. And I was like, yeah, I've failed so bad with weather app. And Jake was like, well, let's talk about it. <laughs> if we're going to get other people on the podcast to talk about failures, why don't you lead by example? And so this is Monday, like three days later, and that's exactly what we're doing. So I actually want to talk through more of the things I think really failed at the launch before we get to like how I hope to potentially recover from this failed launch, because I think it's really instructive. And then for me doing all this stuff, it informs the questions I ask on the podcast. You know, I'm using revenue cat experiments in the app. It informs how I talk to my colleagues about our product internally. I give tons of advice on Subclub. I get tons of advice on Subclub. Apparently, he doesn't I listen didn't to take tons all of the advice. advice. On Subclub. <laughs> I think one of the other big failures I wanted to discuss was pricing. And specifically because we talk so much about pricing and I kind of just failed at every level of the like typical advice that we give. <laughs> so one of them is pricing is not as important as you might think. And it's probably better to launch with a lower price and just get more people using the app and get more subscribers. And I launched with what is probably the highest ticket weather app subscription at $4 a month was fine, but the $40 a year. But interestingly, my biggest regret is not the $40 a year, is that I didn't do a sale on launch. So this is the advice I would have. If you are going to do a big attention grabbing thing, do it with some kind of a discount, 25% off, 50% off, whatever, because all that attention I did get, most of the people who wrote about it listed the price. A lot of people who maybe even read the TechCrunch article, read it on 9to5Mac, read it on Mac Rumors or whatever, Boy Genius Report, they all saw $40 and were like, eh, no way. But if they had seen $40, but ah, 50% off, I think we would Especially have done timed, a lot right? better. It creates like yeah, that urgency. Yeah. Like take action now, don't just wait. Part of the reason I wanted to push the envelope is that I talked to so many folks here on this podcast and we talked to so many people inside Revenue Cat where they have what seem like unreasonably high prices. And my theory now is that, well, one, this is a weather app. It's a commodity good. I should have really better understood like willingness to pay. I should have looked at what other apps are charging and everything. But the other thing is like the source of attention matters a lot. So the apps that are charging a higher rate, they're either creating a lot of demand through paid advertising where there's not a lot of expectation going into it versus getting press, like the attention you get, I think makes a difference to that willingness to pay and the type of people you attract. And then especially apps that are really big with search. If somebody's searching for a weather app and is like looking for a solution, that's a really different audience than people just seeing it in the press and wanting to check it out. So there's like a different kind of intent, a different kind of user, all those things. And so I think it was a bad move pricing it at 40 bucks. I think we probably should have done 30 and then done a discount to 19.99 for the launch. Yeah, it's interesting. Almost definitely this thought is coming from me listening to this podcast. But like the idea that the journey that the users taken at the point when they see the paywall 
being super important, which oftentimes is when you're talking about the onboarding experience, but it's also the attribution as well. It's interesting to think that, yeah, like whether that person came through a splashy launch or press versus the high intent they were searching for it, or they saw an ad on Facebook or whatever, that should also drive what offering you're sort of showing them on that paywall. I don't know if I've ever seen this before, but it would be interesting to, oh, I guess I have, on a launch itself, all the press people that you're trying to get to write an article include a link that has the attribution so that that discount only applies if they get it through their article. If you're launching an otherwise unknown app with a day of press, you can pretty much guarantee anybody who buys it on that day is coming from the press, right? Yeah, but do a time limited sale. Even if 100% of users, that's the case, from the person writing the article story, then being able to say, (laughs) just tell uh, them it is. Nine to five readers are the only, (laughs) well, yeah, that's true. You could just say that. Um, (laughs) Am I coming off unscrupulous? Nobody's (laughs) nobody's gonna mind. It's literally true. If they click, they'll get the discount. Maybe everybody else gets the discount too, but. I think that's something that could live on though, right? Like one of the things for me that I do see in the data and also it's in my head that this is a thing is like, A lot of these journalists for some of the bigger press junkets, they spend a lot of time on SEO. They make these big listicles because they know that one, they'll get a lot of attention on that day, but then they'll get attention for the next six months when somebody buys their new iPhone and they're like, all right, what are these new widgets? Because that's probably when they actually update their phone at the same time. That's a driver of traffic over time for your app as well. Each one of these articles that they write, that deal kind of can live there as well. Oh, that's yeah. also part yeah. of that narrative. That's user journey yeah. all the way to your paywall. So like theoretically, those could even live on there and show a different offering to somebody that came from an article versus somebody who came from searching, I need to know the weather or whatever in the app store. One other thing I did want to mention on pricing is that I priced based on things that I knew and based on my thinking of the value of weather up and my costs in servicing weather up not on the customer perceived value of weather app. And I think that's a huge thing that founders can get themselves tied up in knots about. And I succumbed to it myself is that one of the features that we were leading with that I don't think many people are even using, people didn't even talk about it much, but I was personally so excited about it because this is how I use it is that with weather up 3.0, you can set a different weather source per widget. And so I have a whole home screen dedicated on my iPhone with three widgets and it's Apple weather as a source, Eris weather as a source and AccuWeather as a source. So at a glance, I can see whether any of the forecasts are showing rain coming. I can see the differences in the forecast and everything like that. Super uber nerdy feature. Well, it's also very expensive to do that because every 15 minutes or whatever, it's hitting the server, not one time to one weather data provider. And the weather data is why I had been losing money on the app leading up to this launch was that it's just really expensive to provide weather data. And then widgets and complications are especially expensive because they're constantly updating in the background. So I got myself all twisted in knots thinking, okay, we need to make sure there's a level of profitability here. And if a bunch of people start putting five widgets on their home screen with different locations at different sources and everything else, it's gonna get really expensive for us to service these customers it's really hard to educate customers on how expensive weather data is. And then the fact that it's even more expensive because it's like, give me my clouds, weather man. Like I don't, don't tell me about your business model. I don't want to know. And so I was pricing based on my knowledge of that and my own, like thinking the feature was going to get super hyped. And you only have the one tier, right? It's not like you have a more expensive yeah, plan. I didn't have that multiple that tiers. Exactly. In. So you had to model it in right. like some percentage of users are going to be doing all of this. Yeah, exactly. I'll call back. I don't think we talked about, but you didn't put any product analytics, two causes of death there were one, you didn't have product analytics to tell you how many users are doing this, which we could probably look at the API calls to see like the relative now, you know, the percentages, which then I'm going to bust you for, that's another symptom of not launching. If you had launched this as a standalone thing, you could have like not touched anything, just measured how many people are doing what. And then you would have some idea of like, okay, actually, as long as we charge X, we're going to be able to cover costs because not that many people actually use this feature. There's some risk there, but 
Yeah. And this is why we talk about all this stuff. Like I should have surveyed some users. I should have value-based pricing. Value-based pricing is typically helpful. I think actually in this case, David, value-based pricing is hurtful for your bottom line potentially. Actually not, because I think if you're closer to the perceived value of the product, you'll get a, a better optimum. In value-based pricing, you want to set your pricing to the perceived value for some aggregate of users, as opposed to cost-based pricing, where you're saying it costs me X dollars to deliver, I'm going to charge X plus 5% profit or whatever. In SaaS and stuff, it's really important because the cost to deliver is often very, very low. If you cost price just to your cost, you're giving away too much. And often, especially in SaaS, where you're like, as a developer, having to ask for $100,000 a year, right? <laughs> you really have to be like, gosh, that's so much money for software. But then you go like, well, if I'm replacing a developer or if I'm replacing some amount of headcount or some amount of whatever, now I see the value, right? The value is there and therefore, you know, you can feel it. But you could be on either side of that price curve in the sense that like you're pricing way above the perceived value, the demand's going to drop off again. So value-based pricing doesn't necessarily mean charge more. It just means like charge the perceived value because the costs are only something really the provider of the service cares about. Well, and they're highly variable based on the number of users, which is weird too. Yeah. And, and also like at this stage, like there's some fundamental costs that you can never get below potentially, but like you should really... I mean, when Revenue Cat launched, like our cost structures were really brutal in the early days, right? But it was like, it's okay because eventually we're going to have a team that's going to focus on making everything efficient and driving down costs and whatever. But in the early days, it was just like, turn up the database dial, right? Like just keep burning money. <laughs> um, but obviously a different thing where you have yeah. APIs, you have a more fixed cost. But I think the worst way to do this is to be like, how much did it cost me to build this Yeah. App? And then right. they divide it into that. It's like, no, don't yeah. do that. Don't do that. That's not going to end well for you. And then the bigger problem for me too was on the value-based pricing front is that people have expectations coming into a weather app. Like understanding my market as weather nerds, like who's going to put this widget on their home screen? Weather nerds. Weather nerds already have five other weather apps. They're probably subscribed to two other weather apps. So they have a sense of like what a weather app should cost. And one of the ones I got compared to, which I know Brian, the developer of Carrot Weather, and that's when I got called out against was like, well, Carrot Weather has more features and is only $30 a year on their like most premium tier. And it's true. If I would have thought more about who I was marketing to, I would have realized that they already have that price comparison yeah. in mind. It and... Yeah, it's a real thing to assume the market is already somewhat in equilibrium, especially for something where you have a lot of products. I don't think looking at your competitors, you know, if you're building something truly new, it's harder. But if you're building something that's like, I want to say a commodity, but think of car companies, like car companies are super precise in their pricing, right? Because most cars are commodities, right? They're like slightly differentiated. And so they have to be laser tight with where the market is and they know they won't sell them if they're cost more than this and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, and you got to price in that differentiation too, right? I think that was a little bit of where I was hoping that this was differentiated enough and valuable enough. We got thousands of subscribers at this launch. It wasn't a complete failure. So, I mean, I did kind of prove that a certain number of people were willing to pay a premium for what they perceived to be a premium feature and a premium experience. Now I have the opportunity to experiment. You'd asked earlier about, you know, where do I go from here? And we kind of already covered it. It's like, I'm going to launch again. Am I going to get as much press this time? Probably no. But like you said, I'm going to create one or two features, nothing massive, but one or two features that I think are interesting enough to get some more attention and bundle those up and do a little relaunch. And some people sale. will be seeing it for yes, the first time sale. And, and I'm going to put it on sale. Exactly. Exactly. And then from there, then I can like experiment more with pricing and win back offers and things like so that. So you ran, I want to shill here for a minute because you used a bunch of Revenue Cat stuff, right? You ran in some experiments <laughs> and things like that. Well, how did that stuff go? Because like that's probably more than most folks do on a launch, but I'm curious. What did you set up? What did you use? And like how did that go? Yeah. I mean, I guess as a guest, I get to to show yeah. right? <laughs> well, I want an honest <laughs> customer testimonial. <laughs> Paywalls went way better than I expected. So we use the Revenue Cat footer view where we built a custom Swift UI paywall behind where we're able to do the video, do a lot of like custom fancy stuff, which probably wouldn't have made that much more money if we had just used one of the Revenue Cat templates. But I wanted to do the video on the paywall and everything else. But it was really nice being able to let Revenue Cat just do all the logic behind purchases and everything else. So it saved us a ton of time. I think Brock, who did the development, I think he said the super fancy Swift UI paywall took like less than a day. And then all the like logic and everything else. For context, if people don't know, like we have a paywalls feature at Revenue Cat where we can 
render everything for you and it's all driven by the back end you can change things but there's a version of it where the only ui we render is the actual hard part which is the prices and the cta at the bottom and that stuff and then you can build your own super customized fancy animated marketing view behind it and so that's what you it's use a great there. solution for the developer that wants to like still own the paywall, but you also want to save a bunch of time. <laughs> right? yeah. Well, and selfishly from our perspective, it also means that we do support any bespoke feature that we haven't built yet ourselves into mm -hmm. our. Frame. Yeah. So like at the beginning, we didn't have like videos or if you have certain types of slideshows, even if it's not super complicated, if we haven't built it yet, it is possible. I don't think he had to do anything, Brock, code-wise, because once we were using paywalls to power it, I was able to kick off an experiment. So at launch, I scheduled it, which that's a new feature, scheduling experiments. But I scheduled the experiment to start like midnight the day of launch or 12.01 a.m. the day of launch. And the experiment I launched with, and it, it was so fascinating because Revenue Cat shipped experiments 18 months, two years ago. And I've talked to people who've launched experiments. Charlie, you wrote a blog post about using experiments. Like a lot of people have talked about experiments, but launching an experiment that I conceived of, <laughs> implementing it myself, it was just such a different experience of like dog fooding, revenue cat. And then also, again, podcasts and the advice I give and what experiments to run and all those kind of things. It was so fascinating to set up an experiment myself, run it, look at the results, analyze the results. Real skin else. in the what game too, right? It's easy to talk about somebody yeah. else's decisions and tests and be like, oh, you should do blah, blah, blah. That's what I do all day. But yeah, when it's your money and you're like, I'm actually testing this, it's different. Yep. So it oh, just totally. worked though. That's pretty cool. Like, which it should. Yeah. I say, unless you're putting something embedded in the behind the footer view and the like custom view, like the footer will just automatically adapt to the offering. Even just customizing a paywall for having two different offerings pre without using our stuff would just, it's not insurmountable, but it's days of trudge, you know? So this is the first A-B test I've ever run in 16 years of building apps because it was always such a hassle. I didn't want to pay for SaaS to run A-B tests. I didn't want the developer to spend months building out some bespoke system. So the only way I've tested in the past, which we talk about this on the podcast, and I think it's a valid way to test, is you launch and you look at the numbers and then a week later you update the app with something very different and then you look at the numbers that week and that's a valid way to do it but this is the first time i've ever done a real a b test because it was so easy to do and so the test i did was defaulting to annual being the pre-selected option on the paywall versus monthly being the pre-selected option oh, on the that paywall. subtle so it wasn't it even was like different subtle. price. You were just like subtle UX difference, which you can test with revenue cap paywall. <laughs> <laughs> so just what's the default? And part of the reason I did that is that I was considering just making the monthly the default always, because we've talked to folks here on the podcast about how monthly shortens that feedback loop of like people who are staying engaged with the app and churning quickly and everything like that. And then I also wanted to get some monthly recurring revenue built up because we have monthly recurring costs. And so do we do a big launch where we get a bunch of annual and then we need to budget that over time to make sure that we can keep the weather API bill paid? Or do we try and get more monthly revenue where it's like more consistent over time? So the results were fascinating and I'm looking at the results right now, but the headline is that realized LTV less than a month in. So I don't have renewals yet on the first renewal month. But realized LTV is 60% lower on the people who saw monthly. That makes sense because a lot of the people who saw monthly just stuck with monthly. But I was running some numbers with my colleague, Dan, and this is something that would be really fun for us to model at some point. But, you know, assuming a normal level of churn, I'm unlikely for the realized LTV to cross before the year mark. And then at the year mark, those annual renewals will kick in and the realized LTV will shoot back up again. And so basically I just made less money. <laughs> by launching with this. Well, no, you but, learned, but you learned about something that definitely doesn't work, right? Like you mapped out exactly. the, you mapped probably out the space. Work. I, I think the, probably I think the interesting work, thing yeah. here is when you stop this experiment, you'll still be able to track these cohorts for the next, I think, 400 days or something. I would go back and look at these results after that year mark when your annuals have actually started renewing and then look at your actual lifetime value, not over 30 days, but over that right. full period. Yeah, 366 day of lifetime value instead of yeah. just yeah, the first Because month. that's something that like you can make a lot of 
inferences based on other people you know and what their annual churn rate looks like versus monthly. But at the end of the day, you don't really know until you see what yours looks like. Yeah, the monthly renewals will start coming in this Thursday, actually. And so I'll be able to see pretty quickly. But in revenuecat.com, you can go into the subscriber retention and see the number or percentage of people who have turned off auto renew already. And so I already know that my churn in this first month is already going to be above 30%. So I'm going to retain somewhere around 70% of users, likely not higher because 30% have already turned off auto renew. And so by looking at that, I already kind of know I'm going to retain probably less than 70%. And so then you run some quick math on like, even as that churn declines over time, because month two, it'll hopefully be less and month three, it'll be less and less, like fewer and fewer users will churn and more people will stick around. But like the math's not looking good for those two lines to cross. I'm interested, um, David, so just pre-selecting drove that much difference in behavior. Like how many people on the A still ended up buying monthly? Like, did it make a significant difference? Yeah. Okay. So here are the numbers. I'll round them up up to just make it easy for listeners since we're not going to like have a screen share or anything of the people who saw the annual as a default around 800 of them went with annual but almost 400 selected monthly so a lot of people who saw annual did switch to monthly so like 33 percent of people chose monthly even though they saw annual as a default On the opposite end, the people who saw monthly, there were almost 1,100 people. And this was an even split. So 1,100 people selected monthly. So there was actually a 4.5% increase in people converting to the monthly. So when they saw the $4, more people did start that free trial than people who saw $40. And side note, I am using Apple's new pricing where it is actually just $40. And that's a whole nother experiment I'm actually running currently is the $40 versus $39. We're actually running with our, yeah, yeah, the side-by-sides. I'm, that's my second oh, experiment. We content. Have, We're going to have great content in 2024 because David. I, I don't have enough traffic right now. Somebody help me out. Let's get some traffic <laughs> going. Start driving some ads or something. I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, so it was $40 or $4 a month. And that's another thing is I was kind of experimenting with making the price differential not quite as attractive, but that's another experiment I'd like to run is like making the monthly a little more expensive to drive annual. But in this case, I was kind of like, I want some monthly revenue. And so I wanted it to balance out a little bit. And so I did the 40 and four, which is not a crazy deal for annual where typically people who are pushing annual would make it like 50% off, 60% off to do the annual because they're trying to get that money up front. So people who saw the monthly as a default, it was 1,100 stuck with the monthly and only 100 switched to annual. So way more people who saw annual switch to monthly and almost nobody, like 10%, less than 10%. Less than oh, 10%. That's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's probably going to wipe out your results just there because it sounds like the total number of conversions is similar. It's like 11, 1200, something like this. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. So like just priming people on annual is going to make a huge difference. That's interesting. Especially, I mean, I wonder, I mean, relatively 40 is not the lowest for maybe weather apps, but it's also like some apps are for a year, it's a hundred. So it's already kind of on the low end, but that's really interesting. So 10% more people converted on the monthly. More, oh, you mean on the annual primed, more people converted on monthly? No, oh. people who saw the monthly as a default, more, more of them converted by 10%. Right, 10% right, yeah. more people became subscribers when they saw $4 versus seeing 40. But, and again, we can revisit these numbers. Actually, a little shout out to the community here. I'm actually been sharing charts and the actual results from this in the subclub community. And there's been a great discussion on that. So if you're not already on the subclub community, go to chat.subclub.com. And then there's a join link there to join the community. I shared it in the private area of the community. But yeah, 10% more people converted to become subscribers who saw the $4 instead of the 40. But still, when you start doing the math on the churn on the monthly and everything else, like I'll probably still end up making quite a bit less money on the people who saw monthly and stuck with monthly because get money up front versus like giving them 12 opportunities to churn. Also, also you have to consider the time cost of money, right? That money now is literally worth more value perspective, right? Than it is like. One question to both of you guys, I guess, related to this is when running an experiment like this, right around a launch. Is that data 
not that it's invalid, but isn't that a very different cohort than the people who, for the vast majority of the time, are going to be finding your app through? You're certainly learning more about the preferences of an interesting user base than yeah. you are. And I would Which even is say super valuable for your unsubscribe rate. Especially if you're going for yeah. big launches as your strategy, uh, because it's good to know how to optimize those cohorts. But that's going to be different than a month from now, all the people who are finding your app through just search. And definitely just the volume you already alluded to, David, is like as you're running subsequent tests, your tests, that's a very subtle test split. I mean, I'm interested that there's any sort of like perceivable result there. And actually, I would love to run it for longer to see if that disappeared because you're talking five, six percent like that could be noise. It was statistically significant, though. Yeah, I'd be interested to run those tests on like, yeah, as Charlie was saying, like run rate, like sort of downloads, but you'll have to take bigger swings because the volume of people going to that funnel is going to be a lot lower. So to get statistical significance, you don't want to be testing like green button, blue button. You yeah. want to be testing like a thousand dollars and three dollars, you know, right. like or you want to be testing like the widest versus this completely different. Yeah. Like you're, you're trying to do gradient descent, like a machine learning algorithm trains, right? Like where you want to just create tests that are big enough apart. If you're trying to determine if it's too cheap or too high or whatever, like the bigger differences you take, they'll be notionally correct, right? So like the bigger swings you take, if it's like, oh, actually there's a little more value in the higher side. So like maybe don't make that A or that B your actual number, then like find a new number that's closer and then test that again as well. It's really awesome, David, that you now have a, for a limited time only, no, for a limited amount of effort, you got a paywall set up that you can remotely configure, especially for a developer, like in your position where like, you know, you have to loop somebody else in and you've got other bugs and features and things to be working on. Like now as the business oriented partner, you can pretty much, on your own, be running these experiments, analyzing the data and all of that stuff. And I think it's something yeah, that- Yeah, I didn't even yeah. have to talk to Brock to launch that second experiment. I changed the price on App Store Connect. I already had two SKUs. And so I changed the other annual SKU to $39.99. I left the existing SKU at 40. And I set it all up in Revenue Cat to run this subsequent experiment without touching code, without updating the app, without even talking to Brock actually. <laughs> Did you test it at all, like in a sandbox context or anything like this? Like, no, no just go for it, YOLO. Uh, it's good. I mean, you should be able to, like, it should be fine, especially if the products are already approved and everything. It's really cool. I think this is one thing on Revenue Cat side that we've just kind of started to cobble all these tools together, but like, we haven't yet. And talk about Revenue Cat thinking about what's a launch for us, right? Like, we've been shipping these little features for the last year and a half. And when you see them all start to interplay and play together, now like we have a thing and now it's like having people go through the whole flow. We need to like spread the word on like how to run these tests, like all inside Revenue Cat, how to design plans, how to do it all in one place. Because I think like you said, David, like you never 20 years in or whatever many years the apps store were in, you've never done this before. And that's crazy because it works, right? So I'm excited to see more and more developers do this. And even developers that were already doing it, doing it easier, focusing on other things and things like this. So anyway, revenuecat.com. Yeah. <laughs> before we land this plane, is there anything else with this launch? Either things that you're going to try going forward or were there other failures I missed that you wanted to cover? Another huge failure was just me getting my expectations up. We talk about it on this podcast about product channel fit and all the different things. You know, it got mentioned in TechCrunch, which is a big deal. And I was in 9 to 5 Mac and Mac Rumors and Boy Genius Report, you know, it got a lot of attention. Again, if the DMA hadn't happened, maybe there would have been a little more momentum going. But anytime you're launching an app, you got to think like, okay, where am I getting attention? And then what's the overlap of the attention I'm getting and my ideal customer profile? And then the reality is, no matter how much you want to convince yourself otherwise, is that of those maybe 30,000 people across all the different press mentions I got, let's say 30,000 people, 100,000 people probably saw the headline. Oh, another weather app. I don't care. Even if they are potentially even my like ideal customer profile, they already have three weather app subscriptions and they don't even get past the headline because they just don't even care. And then they see the app and they see the video or they see whatever. And it just whittles it down further and further and further. And so like the real overlap of people who are actually care enough to go click a link and go buy my stupid little app is so small that even when you can get a lot of attention, Again, if that attention isn't a huge overlap of your ideal customer profile, it's just not going to be as impactful as you think. And so back to maybe this whole strategy is played out, unless you're Apple and are launching these massive consumer-friendly apps that genuinely everybody is part of your potential customer base, 
then it's not going to be as impactful as you would hope and assume it would be. So another big lesson. I think maybe the thing there is it's unreliable, not necessarily unimpactful. Because sometimes you can have, like I limped along an update for iOS 17 to get interactive widgets for my app. And it just so happened that for whatever reason, editorial picked it to be in one of their lists and it was the first one in the list. And that was just massively impactful, right? And I've had other ones where I've even gotten on lists, but it was lower down or it wasn't one that they pushed as hard or whatever reason, and it didn't have those numbers. If you keep swinging on those, some of them will be hits and some of them won't. You just got to launch over and over, right? You got to launch over and over. Launch, launch. Somebody should make a podcast with that name. But yeah, especially have a podcast about launching. Yeah. (laughs) Great idea. Yeah, for those who don't know, Charlie runs a podcast called Launched, where he talks mostly to indie developers about launching and running their app businesses. But yeah, I have it in the notes. Like, where do I go from here? It's launch, get feedback, iterate, update, get feedback, launch. From here, it's ship, ship, ship. And then keep doing these experiments and keep trying new things, keep taking swings. And there's the episode title. We don't do that for this one, do we? But it should be ship, ship, ship. All right. Well, David, it was a pleasure having you on your own podcast. Thank you for joining yourself. Where can people find you and your work? I think we should plug Charlie's work. I think, <laughs> like, where can people find you, Charlie? Revenuecat.com. I write articles on the blog. No, I, I'm on all the different social media things. Most places, it's Charlie M. Chapman on Twitter, which is what I will still call it. It is underscore Chuck EC, I think, is my handle there. And then I have an app called Dark Noise, which is a white noise app which provides lots of fodder for good Revenue Cat content, as well as a podcast. We'll, we'll have you on after a failed launch. Yeah, perfect, well, so. perfect. To make it. <laughs> and I guess, David, you don't really plug Contrast. So it's Contrast.co, right? Is where you can yeah. find all your apps. Contrast, that's yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. And the links, of course, will all be in the show notes. And I'm actually not the one who has to put them there. So I'm excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> It's nice. But yeah, anybody else willing to share stories of failed launches and failed product updates and screw ups and everything else, get in touch. David at revenuecat.com. I want to hear more stories like this. Hopefully I broke the ice a little being really open and honest about some of my failures with this launch. And the thing is, like the story is not written, right? Like we talked about this launch was a disappointment, but there's still a huge opportunity. And hey, I got close to 2000 people to pay 40 bucks a year for my stupid little weather. App. Like, yeah, I don't know where the failed came cool. in your head, David, at all. I think that's an unqualified dub in my mind. So, All right. Well, it was super fun talking to you guys. Thanks for uh, having me on. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. If you have a minute, please leave a review in your favorite podcast player. You can also stop by chat.subclub.com to join our private community.